The Ten Worst French Aircraft When compiling this list of terrible French aircraft, we ran up against a problem. France hasn't made many. When we created features on the worst British, American and Soviet aircraft, we were spoiled for choice. But here we had to work a little harder. Ooh la la, France certainly made some mediocre aeroplanes and some flawed designs, though few compete with the truly nightmarish offerings of the other great aircraft-producing nations. Don't worry, though, mes pauvres lapins. We found a bunch of wonderfully weird French losers, guaranteed to disturb the carefully cultivated sang-froid of even the most blasé boulevardier de Paris. Light up a gitane. Stick Gansburg on the high thigh, raise a disdainful eyebrow, and prepare to meet the ten worst French aircraft. 10. Blériot 125. Vern, baby, Vern. After the magnificent achievement of flying across the channel in his excellent Type 11 monoplane, Louis Blériot spent the whole of the rest of his life trying to detract credibility from himself. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the series of large aircraft his company built throughout the 1920s. Seemingly engaged in a competition with himself to produce the aircraft most resembling a Jules Verne creation, Blériot manufactured a series of unsuccessful bombers and airliners, whose outlandish appearance were in direct proportion to their operational mediocrity. Chief among these incredible duds was the 125. In October 1927, Blériot saw Fritz Lang's seminal film Metropolis and, taking the idea that life imitates art at glaringly face value, set about building an airliner to encapsulate the science fiction aesthetic he had so enjoyed on that autumn night at the Gaumont Palace cinema Montparnasse. This is probably untrue, but we can't find any other way to explain the appearance of the Blériot 125 when, in 1930, it emerged from the chrysalis of its hangar like a fantastical butterfly from a daring Art Deco future. Regrettably, an airliner carrying its passengers in twin fuselages resembling railway carriages, whilst housing its engines and luckless pilots in a teeny car-shaped pod atop the single massive wing, turned out not to be the way forward. As is proven, by the complete and ongoing absence of any other aircraft of this configuration. As it happened, the Blériot 125 turned out to be underpowered, with severe controllability issues. One can hardly be surprised. Huge aircraft, two draggy fuselages, modest engines all optimistically directed about the sky by two teeny tiny rudders. At least with such massive side area, the 125 must have possessed impressive directional stability. The problems ultimately proved insuperable. After three years of tinkering, it still wouldn't fly properly and was ignominiously scrapped, having never carried a fair-paying passenger. Being fair to Blériot Aeronautique et ça, we acknowledge their few relatively unremarkable, acceptable designs, all largely forgotten now, of course, but who cares? Blériot's crazed failure from a beautiful, unattained alternative future remains far more entertaining. 9. The Minier HM-14, Pou de Ciel, micro -lousy. Pauvre Henri Minier, the tragic tale of the HM-14 Pou de Ciel in English, literally, Louse of the Sky, could so easily have been completely different. A mere six inches or so of wing overlap separated unprecedented success from tragic disaster. Minier was a romantic figure, a radio engineer, though some sources claim he was a furniture maker, whatever, with a self-deprecating sense of humor, a fascination with flight, and a chronic inability to fly a conventional aircraft. The latter quality inspired him to try and develop a new type of aircraft 
which would be simple, easy, and safe to fly. Le Pou de Ciel would ultimately achieve two out of three of these qualities. Furthermore, this was to be an egalitarian aircraft, straightforward to construct and designed to be built at home in a four-meter square room. In designing an aircraft easy for non-pilots to fly, leave aviation to the aviators, he once quipped, somewhat cryptically. Minier's aircraft was genuinely revolutionary. The Pou de Ciel had no ailerons, lateral control deriving from the rudder and its interaction with the pivoting front wing. The only controls were the throttle and the stick, which operated the pivoting wing and rudder, and flying the Pou proved easy and intuitive. Remarkably, the aircraft was designed to be impossible to stall. If the front wing did enter a stall, the airflow from it over the rear wing forced the nose down slightly, and the Pou automatically recovered. The future appeared bright for Minier's machine, especially after he and his wife flew the Pou de Ciels over the channel to Britain, where it was dubbed the Flying Flea, and there began a short-lived craze for building and flying Minier's creation. Unfortunately, the phrase short-lived would prove all too accurate in a rather more literal sense. Between August 1935 and May 1936, seven HM-14s were lost in inexplicable fatal accidents, and the authorities in both France and the UK grounded all flying fleas. Wind tunnel tests were undertaken in both nations, and it was discovered that the airflow from the pivoted front wing when pulled back to point the aircraft up increased lift from the rear wing, pointing the aircraft inexorably down. Ironically, the same effect that prevented a stall occurring and made the aircraft safe. If the Pou de Ciel entered a 15 degree dive, recovery was impossible and the luckless pilot was carried into the ground in the appropriately coffin-shaped fuselage. Minier quickly developed a successful fix for the suicidal tendency of his creation, basically moving the rear wing back the aforementioned six inches. But neither his own nor his flea's reputation ever fully recovered, although many modified variants of the basic design have since been constructed. A curious aside of this sorry tale is that, because none were flown after 1936, Many original hm 14s survived to the present day, so it is likely that you won't have to travel far if you want to have a look at the deadly Skylouse in the flesh. Wit, the Dassault, Balzac and Mirage 3.5 Harrier Carrefour as F-4s and MiG-21s poured off production lines in their thousands, aircraft designers looked for unconventional ways to kill test pilots, spend billions, and make aircraft that nobody wanted. The best solution to this was the vertical takeoff and landing fighter. When NATO issued Basic Military Requirement No. 3 in the early 1960s, manufacturers swarmed around it like wasps to ice cream. If World War III kicked off, the type would be based in austere locations away from known airfields, fly supersonically, and drop retaliatory tactical nukes on the invading Soviet hordes. The fact that at the time of the brief there wasn't even a subsonic jet VTOL fighter didn't stop this ambitious concept. Anyone who was anyone in fighter design submitted a proposal. Dasso with a concept based on the Mirage III. Vertical propulsion would be provided by eight small lift jets embedded in the fuselage. Lift jets, it was hoped, meant vertical flight without the perils of tail sitting and without the limitations of inevitably non afterburning vectored thrust. The planned fighter, the 3 5, was to be large, around the length of a Super Hornet, but a smaller test bed, the Balzac, was modified from a Mirage 3 prototype. One lethal crash later, many were questioning the sense of the project. It had many problems, including 
gross instability, stall-inducing exhaust re-ingestion, debris sucking, a troublesome main engine, and underpowered lift engines. But hey, nobody's perfect. Even if some of these foibles were solved in its later big brother, the Mirage 3.5, there remained a few other issues. The terrible payload, horrendous maintenance requirements of multiple engines, and awful range, thanks to the Gansborg-esque thirsts of the lift jets in the hover and their taking up most of the internal space where fuel tanks could have been located. When the large Mirage 3.5 crashed in 1966, it was time to knock the whole thing on the head. Still, at least, the Mirage 3.5 grabbed the absolute speed record for a VTOL aircraft at Mach 2.03, a record unlikely to ever be surpassed. Incidentally, the Mirage G8 still holds the European speed record at Mach 2.34. NATO never managed to get its shit together and mass order a single fighter type, despite the huge cost savings inherent in such a scheme. Numero 7. Airbus Helicopters Tigre. Hapless in Seattle. While the Opel Tigre car, developed by Germany, France and Spain, is a huge success, its rotary craft, almost namesake, created by the same nations, has proved a huge disappointment. It's a bit of a push to blame the Tigre purely on France, but as it's now under the Airbus Helicopters label, headquarters at Marseille-Provence Airport, it's fair game. But we can be generous and let Spain and Germany shoulder some of the responsibility for what has been described as a Ford attack helicopter at Lamborghini prices. Development was at the pace of an escargot. The requirement was issued in 1984 yet the type didn't enter service until 2003. And even then, it couldn't do very much. Integration of weapon systems proved slow and very expensive. Only one export customer bought the Tigre. The first two helicopters were delivered to Australia in 2004. Full operating capability was planned for 2011. Well, that didn't actually happen until 2016. Before that, in 2012, after multiple incidents with cockpit fumes that endangered aircrew, Australian pilots refused to fly the Tiger until all safety concerns were resolved. In 2016, an Australian defence white paper announced that the Tiger helicopters would be replaced with other armed Renekons aircraft in the mid-2020s. Hardly a long life for such an expensive acquisition. The US Army have flown Apaches since 1986, and in updated form, the type remains in production today. Issues cited by the Australian paper included the shipping time of sending parts across the world for repair, a lack of commonality with other Tiger variants, and the high maintenance cost of the engines. In 2013 prices, a French HAD cost 49 million US dollars a pop, 14 million more than the far superior Apache. It's hard to know how they got it so wrong. Whatever the reason, it ended up as a very costly way to not buy Apaches. 6. Newport de Lage. NID 37 type course. Après moi, le délage. The French philosopher Michel Foucault was skeptical of absolute ideas. Perhaps Foucault would have approved of the Sesqui plan, designed by Gustave Delage, which denied such absolute notions as being either a monoplane or a biplane instead opting to be one and a half planes. These made great fighters in World War I, so Delage kept going with the concept for his post-war races. He flirted with pure biplanes with a Newport Delage NID 29V. NID 29V? 
which smashed the world's speed record in 1920 at an impressive 194 miles per hour, but returned to his one-and-a-half obsession with the Nieuport de l'Age Sesquiplane. The following year, the new aircraft bettered the 29V by clocking 205 miles per hour, a speed cars would only take seven years to equal with Campbell's Bluebird. At the Coupe Deutsch race, this same racer crashed for reasons unclear, perhaps wing flutter or a bird strike, in the capable hands of Sadi Lecointe. In 1922, Delage came out with an even faster sesquiplane, the Nid 37 Type Corse. The transette looked and was weird. It had a broad aile inferieure, the wing-like shoe for the main landing gear or half-wing that defines the sesquiplane, minute wings, and a sleek streamlined fuselage that resembled a bomb painted red and white. To add to its eccentric appearance, the radiator hung under the nose in a lobster pot. On the day of the first flight attempt, the test pilot, again the heroic Sadi Lecointe, sat astride the engine, with the paddles attached to the back of the 407 horsepower motor, ready for the type's first flight. At full throttle, the machine raced across the airfield, displaying no intention whatsoever to leave the ground. Lequant tried repeatedly to coax the reluctant machine into the air, only giving up when the carburetor burst into flames and burnt his feet. Sank. Simplex Arnoux from 1922. Race with the Devil René Arnoux had pioneered tailless flying wings, designing his first as early as 1909. When he put his mind to creating the fastest possible racer, he retained his disdain for the tail. The racer was built to win the Coupe Deutsch race of 1922. It was to be flown by the World War I ace Georges Madon. The resulting aircraft, the Simplex Arnoux, was tiny and lethal. Interwar racing pilots were used to limited views from the cockpit and vicious handling characteristics, but even by these standards, the Simplex Arnoux was a nasty aeroplane. The enormously broad-corded wing obscured the view down, the barrel radiator obscured the view ahead, and blasted the unfortunate pilot with scorching hot air. It also had appalling control authority as Madon found on a pre-race trial flight. The Simplex Arnoux was too much to handle, even for a pilot with 41 confirmed victories and 64 probables, and the resultant crash caused him severe injuries. Numero 4. Antoinette Monobloc. Ian Jury and the Monobloc Heads. In the very early days of aviation, the Antoinette monoplane was massively successful, a supremely elegant machine when compared to the Wrights, Farmans and Voisins that were its contemporaries. At its heart was the world's first V8 engine, patented by Léon Le Vavasseur, intended for speedboats, and named Antoinette after the daughter of his financier, Jules Gaston Bide. And what an engine it was, boasting exceptional smoothness and refinement and a power-to-weight ratio unsurpassed for 25 years. It's hardly surprising that early aviation pioneers beat a path to Le Vavasseur's door to obtain an example of his brilliant engine. Alberto Santos Dumont's 14B made the first aircraft flight in Europe and was powered by an Antoinette. Samuel Cody made the first flight in a British-built aircraft with an Antoinette engine, and an Antoinette powered Paul Cornu's helicopter the first to leave the ground, to name but three. When Le Vavasseur branched into building complete aircraft around his engine, the future looked bright indeed, especially when famed Anglo-French pilot Hubert Latham started to set altitude and distance records in them. The company helped set up a flying school, training, amongst others, the first female pilot to fly combat missions, Marie Marvinct and developed the world's first flight simulator. Antoinette was on top of the world. Thus, the utter and complete failure of the Antoinette monobloc was tragic indeed. The aircraft was years ahead of its time, the world's first cantilever monoplane wings, 
fully fed undercarriage in huge spats, and a beautifully streamlined fuselage which completely enclosed the Antoinette engine. For 1911, this was extremely futuristic. Unfortunately, it couldn't fly. The monobloc was underpowered by the 50-horsepower V8 engine that had propelled its immediate predecessor, the Antoinette 7, which had weighed 590 kilograms and could hurtle to a maximum speed of 70 kilometers per hour. All the fascinating features of the monobloc had pushed its weight up to 935 kilograms, and 70 kilometers per hour, or indeed any speed at all, would remain an unattainable dream. Nonetheless, Hubert Latham took it to the Concorde Militaire at Rheims, where he gamely demonstrated its utter inability to fly to the assembled military dignitaries of many nations. Within a year, the Antoinette Company was liquidated. 3. SPAD SA Free Spadicles have you ever stood inches in front of the whirling propeller of a frontline fighter from the First World War? Have you then made a small wooden canvas box to sit in? Have someone bolted to the front of said fighter, then got in it, with the whirling blades of the propeller maybe a foot away from your precious head, whilst an undertrained adolescent flies it, and more importantly you, up into a sky in which lurk hundreds of people in better aircraft who are all trying to kill you. Of course you haven't. You're not a total idiot. Yet that was exactly the fate of the observer of the SPAD SA, an aircraft apparently specifically designed to maim, kill, or at best terrify one of its occupants. The design was a cruelly logical response to the problem of firing a machine gun through the airscrew arc of a conventional tractor aircraft. If you can't shoot through the propeller, just attach the gun in front of the propeller and the gunner to fire it. The idea was not unique. The Royal Aircraft Factory in the UK built the experimental BE-9 with the same layout, but the British machine was wisely discarded while the SPAD SA went into service. It was not popular. As well as the obvious inherent horror of the design, the gunner's perilous nacelle was prone to extreme vibration and on several occasions detached from the rest of the aircraft, with lethal consequences. Communication between the crew was impossible, and in the event of the aircraft tipping onto its nose, a common occurrence at the time, the observer would be crushed. A British evaluation of the type came to the chillingly sardonic conclusion that it would be expensive in observers if flown by indifferent pilots. Numéro 2. Le Bloch 150. Early. Bloch party. By 1935, it was a fair bet that any new conventional aircraft built by an experienced design team would be able to fly. However, every now and then, a machine unable to leave the ground would emerge to challenge such assumptions. The Bloch MB-150 fighter was just such an aircraft. Attempts to get the new fighter off the ground were abandoned in 1936, as well as being embarrassing. The ensuing delay as the aircraft was redesigned cost precious months and meant that, when the fighter was most desperately needed, it was not available in sufficient numbers. It is probably an exaggeration to claim that the failure of the original MB-150 to fly cost France victory in the air, but it certainly didn't help. Even once the Bloch had been developed into an aeroplane that could actually fly, it wasn't exactly a stellar performer. With its wonky nose, the engine was pointed slightly to the left to counteract airscrew torque. Slab-sided fuselage, apparently undersized wings, cumbersome tail unit, and crudely massive gun barrels, it could hardly be described as a looker either. It was, at least, incredibly strong and able to survive remarkable levels of combat damage, which was lucky given its lack of speed and agility. 
Ultimately, Marcel Bloch changed his name and that of his company to Dassault, consigning the embarrassment of the MB 150 to another age and, to the casual observer, another aircraft company. Un, potes 630 et 631, the fighter variants. Le BF 110. Had the Potes 630 and 631 fighters been able to avoid combat, it would have been just another pre-war mediocrity hardly worthy of mention. Unfortunately for it and its crews, it was committed to aerial warfare against, amongst others, a far superior aircraft that it just happened to uncannily resemble. During the 1930s, most of the world's major air forces flirted with the idea of twin-engined heavy fighters. These shared a common concept, that a larger fighter aircraft could effectively escort bombers deep into enemy territory, deep into enemy territory, making up for any deficiency in agility deriving from their size, when compared with opposing single-engine fighters, with heavier firepower and speed. Sadly, the concept was flawed. World War II-era twin-engine fighters were never a match for their single-engine counterparts, as the debacle of the Messerschmitt Bf 110 in the Battle of Britain serves to demonstrate. The Messerschmitt was an excellent aircraft, with a faster climb rate than a Spitfire, yet it was unable to survive against determined fighter opposition, ultimately needing to be supplied with a fighter escort, even though it was supposed to be an escort fighter. Imagine, then, how much worse it would have been if it hadn't been such an excellent aircraft and you might have a reasonable idea of the hopelessness of the Potes 630. The Potes 630 family was a diverse group of aircraft with pleasant flying characteristics comprising derivatives optimized for every conceivable role, from army cooperation to bombing. And in general, it performed adequately, if not spectacularly, during the fighting over France and after. The fighter variant was at least well-armed, boasting two 20mm cannon in a ventral gondola and two fixed machine guns, one firing backwards, plus a machine gun on a flexible mount for the second crewman. However, it never had sufficiently powerful engines to propel it to a decent speed and proved to be slower than many of the German bombers that it was supposed to be shooting down. Against modern fighters, it had no chance at all. The aforementioned Messerschmitt 110, with an extra 750 horsepower on tap, was a full 120 kilometers per hour faster. Unfortunately for the Potes, from most angles, it looked very similar indeed to the German fighter. It is not known how many friendly fire incidents resulted in losses, but there are very many documented instances. Pity the poor Potes pilot. Strapped into an aircraft with inadequate performance, expected to chase down bombers that he is unable to catch, and shot at by friend and foe alike from invariably superior aircraft. Hushkit.net only exists thanks to people like you digging in your pockets and helping. If you enjoyed this, go to Hushkit.net and donate. Follow us on Twitter and tell all of your lovers. Fun. Huh.